Uh-huh. It is 6.02, um, so I'd like to call this meeting to order, and um, I assume, Brian, by this agenda, it means we do not have minutes to vote on at this point, mm-hmm. yep. nor, nor are we voting on the warrants that I just signed, so we're going to go right to the tax classification hearing at 6 o'clock. Um, yep. I'll read Brian, the notice if you want. Yeah, please do. Legal notice, Town of Waitley. The Select Board of the Town of Waitley will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, December 8th, 2021 at 6 p.m. via Zoom, meeting ID 892-3090-1649, passcode 734214, or join meeting by telephone 1-888-788-0099, U.S. toll-free 1-877-853-5247, U.S. toll-free. For the purpose of determining the current year's tax allocation between the five classes of taxable real property, residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property. For more information, contact the Board of Assessors. And it was uh, published by Jonathan Edwards Chair, and it ran in the Greenfield Recorder on November 29th. Okay. Um, does anybody want to start the conversation with, 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 with thoughts? Uh, I know I've got tons, but I, I'm going to... I'm not going to comment. Do you, want, do you want me to do a, a quick, a quick overview of, of the of the tax policy decisions that you got to make tonight? Yeah, give people options that were that were mulling over. That would be great. Okay. And the current and, and and cite the current, please, Brian. Yeah. All right. One second. I'm going to share my screen so that. There it is. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so I, I won't go through this um, in, in as much detail as I did last time, but every fiscal year before the tax rate is set, the select board has to hold a public hearing to consider tax rate options available to the municipality. And that's what tonight is. Um, so there's really four decisions that need to be voted on by the board tonight. Um, well, ideally tonight, but before we set the before we send out tax bills, which are need to go out by the, the end of the year. Um, select board is required to make decisions on the following tax policy options: single or split tax rate, the open space disc, whether to grant an open space discount, whether to grant a residential exemption, and whether to grant a small commercial exemption. Just real quickly, um, the split tax rate is uh, single as opposed to split. So the state allows municipalities to group um, those classes of of property into two groups, being residential and open space, and then the other one, commercial, industrial, and personal. Um, And the the select board, the town has the option to uh, shift the tax burden between those two groups. and that creates what would what would create a split tax rate um, with one of those groups paying either a higher or lower rate than the other. Um, and then obviously the, the flip side of that is um, if there was no shift, then um, there would be a single tax rate and all five of those classes of property would pay would pay the single rate. Um, so that's the, the single or split rate. Open and, space. And just, dis- so, just so we're clear, currently Waitley has a single tax rate. Currently Waitley has a single tax rate. All classes of property currently pay the same tax rate. Um, the other, so the next question is whether to grant an open space discount. Um, currently this is, this is eligible, f- this is um, can be applied to all class two open space properties. Currently, wait, um, the way that cl- open space is classified on Waitley, uh, the class two classification is not used. So this really isn't isn't an option for, for the town at this time, but it's, a, it's still one of the four questions. Residential exemption. The select board may grant a residential exemption to all class one residential properties that are the principal residence of the taxpayer. So that means for for people who live in the house, essentially. Um, The assessed valuation of each residential parcel parcel that is a domicile of the taxpayer is reduced by a calculated amount. So what this does is it it doesn't change the, I'm gonna, residential open space, I'm gonna refer to as RO. 
in, uh, commercial industrial personal, I'm going to probably refer to as CIP. Um, so with the residential exemption shifts the tax burden within the residential uh, properties, meaning it doesn't affect the commercial industrial and personal properties. Um, but what it does is it, is it, it exempts um, residential properties that are the principal residence of the taxpayer. So this shifts the burden to really rental properties, vacation homes, apartments, condos, um, those types of things, um, which, which Waitley does not have a lot of. And then the last one is a small commercial exemption. Um, the select board may grant a small commercial exemption to all, all class three commercial properties that are occupied by businesses with an average annual employment of no more than 10 people and on a property with an assessed valuation of less than $1 million. Um, similar to the residential exemption, the assessed value of each eligible commercial property is reduced by a calculated amount. Um, and that, again, that doesn't affect the RO class of properties. It's a shift within um, the commercial industrial uh, class. Um, so those are really the four questions. Um, I don't, I don't know where we want to go from here. Um, ask a quick question. Um, you mentioned that we don't, the, um, is, well, the first question split or not split. I understand that the yep. second question, open space, uh, exemption or reduction. Well, that doesn't really apply to us. Um, the primary residence. Well, we've got very, very few of those. So it's, it's um, hard to see where we see a, a big impact there. Yep. On the businesses, do we have a good idea of how many businesses we have that would, uh, would most of the businesses qualify for that small business exemption or reduction, I guess is really a better word. Like what's the, like what fraction of our businesses or what fraction of that CIP tax base is from small businesses that would qualify and how much is for businesses that are too big to qualify. By that, I don't have a good idea from about, um, and I'm not, it might've been in one of those spreadsheets that you sent us, but I, I couldn't find a definitive answer myself. Maybe this is in there though somewhere. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. And if, if Fred or Fred want to yeah. uh, make a comment, um, so, oh, oh, I see it. And now I see it down the bottom here. Yeah, I had, I hadn't shown this slide yet, um, but we looked at it last time. But um, so we have 51 commercial properties, 15 industrial, 27 mixed use, 49 personal um, property accounts, essentially. So around 142 CIP properties. Um, so according to the list obtained by the assessors, and we still have the zip code, we still have the zip code issue that we had mentioned last time. Um, so we're not entirely sure how many additional there are. Um, so it looks, it's, it's going to look like it, it's not going to do a significant, it's not going to be a significant exemption for, um, so this, I say all the companies except one, which I'm guessing is Yankee Candle. I'm pretty sure they have more than 10 employees. Every other place, like even the, the convenience store on um, five and 10 has fewer than 10 employees on average. I think it's, but I, I think they look at employees in total. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, well, in total, they have fewer than 10. I mean, in total in, in the company itself. I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just employees that work in that one location. Yeah. Then I, I guess then I don't understand why there's only one company that has more than 10 employees. Right. There's the- uh, Less than 10. No, greater than 10. Right. It's, it appears all of the companies would either qualify for the exemption or do not own CIP properties, meaning they would pay the residential rate. I'm pretty sure the convenience store at the corner of five and 10 and 116 is not a resident, is not gonna pay the residential rate but I'm pretty sure they have more than 10 employees. It's Irving, right? I, I think that also, also the, 
the list of companies, it's the list that you're, uh, Brian's referring to is the list that are certified as having less than 10 employees, not all businesses. Right. Oh, 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 oh. What is that? So I guess, so my, I guess my question is, what's, like, how big of, of the, among like the, the CIP tax base, which I know this is just shifting money within that category. Um, is it like 50-50 between companies with more than 10 and companies with less than 10? Or is it more like 90% of that tax base is really small companies and 10% are like a couple of two, three big companies? I have no idea. That's the thing I can't figure out from what I have in front of me. And maybe I should be able to, but I'm just not able to. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. It's certainly going to be a substantial amount of the taxation that is companies that don't qualify because both Yankee Candle and Covestro would not qualify. Mm -hmm. And they represent a quarter to a third of these CIP mm. assessments. Okay, so it's at least a quarter to a third of the commercial tax base is large is companies. those two properties. And possibly up to two thirds could benefit from the small commercial um, exemption um, or reduction. Pro probably less than that because you do have properties so, like yeah. the, the Irving Convenience Store Right. If that's taken company wide. That won't qualify. Right. Uh, underground supply probably won't qualify because I think I saw their assessment is over a million dollars. Our, right. our our tenant at Fort Sandy Lane would not qualify. Yeah. Uh, so lo lo looking at the list that was that was we got certified from the Commonwealth, and it's difficult to to look at other lists or other other groupings. For employees, because I'm not sure that's public information, and we have no ex, no way of knowing how many employees work in commercial or industrial. But anyway, looking at that list we've got of I don't know what 25 or 26 businesses, I looked at in detail. There's maybe two that would qualify for this. Two, they're not high paying, not high paying uh, properties. Assess values, but there may be two. That's the most that, that I could come up with that would qualify for this exemption. Fred, I would think there have to be more than that. I think no, no. I looked at the properties. They have to be either commercial or industrial. There's other businesses that are not that are not uh, categorized that way as, as as CIP properties. Residential have have employees. There's home based businesses that are residential that have less than 10 employees. That's so that's, they would not be affected. No. And we have no idea how many of them are. How many well, of them are because this only applies what the Commonwealth sent us for uh commercial properties. It, commercial properties or commercial usage. Because oh, they're I, different things. The use code and the assessment classification are to, different we'd have to go look at that uh you guys we should know all this already we're, we're, this conversation is is the poster child for we don't have the information we need can i can i add something yeah um so i went through this list and that 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 the board of assessors uh, had from the state which shows certified um, companies that have um, certified as 10 or less employees. And I use the addresses and I, I compare that against our against those addresses for commercial industrial um, yeah. for the commercial and industrial accounts. Right. And the only one the that is on that list that I know, I'm going to say this backwards. Um, when I went through, I think there are three that I that I can say for certain would okay. qualify, but that's not that's not a large number from that from that mm -hmm. twenty six. Um, so it's either that there's not it's either that, and a great majority of these are look to be what I would consider home based businesses. I don't recognize them as as businesses as businesses that I know in the community. Um, 
but I, when I went through, I, I could I could identify three that were listed either commercial or industrial and on the list. Okay, so those folks are not paying. Uh, they're not. They're, the taxes they pay are not a part of the the commercial industrial pot of of money of tax levy. I guess is that a fair statement? No, Joyce, it's not a full no. exemption either. It's a, oh no, I understand. That's why I like the word reduction instead of exemption. But the word okay. exemptions on but, this slide. Yeah. No, they still they still pay commercial uh, property right. tax. No, no, I understand. But what I'm trying to get at um, is that, like in most of the, the situ situations, that, like in all of these, such, most anyway, it seems like we just have such an imbalance that if you do a, a, essentially a split rate, you know, a discount for one group compared to another group, that if the group that's getting a discount is too big, then the group is not getting a discount like, for every dollar you save the big group, the little group pays like one over N times that. Um, so like with the split tax rate, it's four to one roughly. So for every dollar you save uh, someone in their residential, you're gonna have to charge the businesses $4, okay? And then if you just now thinking about the open space, well, that does, we don't have anybody who qualifies for that. If we look at the like re primary residents, well, if 90% of our people <clears throat> of our housing is primarily residential, you know, to save those people one dollar, you've got to raise the rate, raise the taxes on rental properties by nine dollars. So there's like, like not much of a, an upside for the people who might benefit, and a huge downside for the people who wouldn't. I was thinking maybe in that commercial, if it's closer to 50-50, right? Then you, you know, for every dollar you save one group, you charge the other group an extra one dollar. It's like one-to-one -one parity. Then it starts making a little more sense in my mind to try and work with that. Um, because we, we're always up against the law of small numbers. And then the other law of unintended consequences, <laughs> right? Um, so it seems to me, if we don't really have anybody who qualifies for that small business discount, if we only have three potentially out of all of that, then we're sort of just in the other lopsided situation. Um, and and does it, it doesn't make sense when our groups are sort of in the extremes to do the, the like a split rate or a discount. And that's my opinion and I'll let somebody else speak now. Joyce, you're, 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 you're talking about a lot of different uh, aspects of, of the tax rate here, split tax rate, commercial and whatever, uh, and the percent yep. that, that were commercial. This, the working group, we looked at that. We need to, we, we showed you numbers. I think mm -hmm. we need to we need to focus on some of that information rather than we can talk in generalities all night long and still not come up with a conclusion. But the basic assumption, I think we all know that a split tax rate benefits residential and and it impacts the commercial more. That, that's a given. And it's, it depends on how you want to split that. How much do you want to go for one way, commercial or residential? We looked at that in a working group. We looked at how much I, is the CIP. I, I know. How much and I is saw your work for Waitley. How right. do we compare it to other towns? How do we compare it to other towns that have a split rate? How do we compare statewide? We looked at we looked at the percent CIP. We looked at our assessed values. We we looked at some scenarios of different tax rates, and we kind of come up with average values for residential and CIP and what the impact would be. And and, and, uh, and Fred, Fred, I read all of that. Okay, and my well, is we, we, not, we, my we conclusion need, is it's not worth changing. To, we need to okay? focus on that to show the, the impact and 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 I did. Well, I did. I, I I I read and I think I understood all of that. But, and I think it's good to have all of that data, but I just don't think I see a compelling story for changing what we're doing at this moment. I'm gonna chime in here. Um, yeah. The First of all, I'm, I'm not sure we have enough information on, on in some of these areas. That being said, 
Um, from a small commercial exemption perspective, uh, I'm not prepared to ask for more from, I can think of three companies just as, as my, my examples. One is an iconic company in Whaley. A second is our largest employer. And our third has demonstrated significant investment in the growth of their company in Waitley, in our industrial park. And to, to say to the iconic company or the largest employer or the company that wants to grow in Waitley, has grown and wants to continue to grow, that we're gonna to add to your tax, tax rate, I, I'm not comfortable with that at all. Um, I think that the residential and commercial one-to-one -one split has worked well for Waitley. I think we're in the majority, I know we're in the majority of, of communities across across Franklin County. And I think that that the percentage of, of commercial, of our commercial tax rate is actually pretty healthy for the, for the town the size of Waitley um, with our limited growth potential in terms of more commercial. So- Any chance I could jump in? Yeah, and I'm just let me just finish, Paul, for one second. I, so I'm with Joyce. I'm not prepared to, to, to make any changes to this personally. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Um, you know, I was part of this working group from, from the beginning, and I totally support it. And um, pretty much it was the gen. Um, it was Fred Barron that, that really got this off the ground, and, and I completely support him because. I truly felt we had to look at the process. <laughs> God bless you. Yes. And what the process has shown me is that there are a number of loose ends. There are a number of unanswered questions that it would be very tough to move forward on in making any kind of change. And if there were to be a change, it would create a certainly a, a, a climate of uncertainty here in this town for any commercial operation. Because yeah, we if we change the tax rate this year, are we gonna change it again? Is it gonna escalate up? Um, what are you gonna do? It's certainly not gonna be um, a town that that is um, looked at kindly from that perspective. And I, 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 I don't think this should die on the vine. You know, I kind of think it, it should it should continue and we should refine what this really does, what what the benefit is, because at the beginning of all of this, I still don't understand, at least from my perspective, is there a dire need to do this? Is there a problem in the community from a tax base perspective that is that that um the management of the town needs to make a change to help <coughs> residents within the town. I'll shut up. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think there's, there's more information available. We didn't, Brian didn't present the one table about tax rates for surrounding towns and how we fare on, uh, on our commercial corridor on route five. But anyway, uh, I've reached out to talk to several communities that have done a detailed study of split tax rates, particularly Amherst, Great Barrington, and, uh, and, and Greenfield. Uh, you can read their reports. They're all online. They looked at it, and they concluded that they don't want a split rate. They want a single rate. So I kind of asked each one of them, what was behind that decision? What made you do that? What made you not vote for a split rate because you can show with the data who's going to benefit and not. And, and their answer was the business community. The small businesses in town are the ones that, that spoke up and said they were going to suffer. That it's difficult for them to pay more taxes. Your bigger companies, yeah, the two bigger ones, three bigger ones we have in town, it doesn't matter. They're going to pay the tax anyway. They can afford to pay that. But it's the smaller ones that don't afford they can't afford to pay that. They're having difficulty. 
So that, that is part of our community here. There is a so we, number so, of that. So Fred, let me let me let me stop you there because I don't think anyone's disagreeing. So I'm not sure that we, we don't want to keep repeating ourselves because I, I haven't okay. heard anyone disagree with anything that Joyce, me, or Paul has said, or it sounds like you. So I don't want to I don't want to prolong a discussion. I, I, I will disagree with some of it, but go on. Okay. So I guess I'd like to hear from people who have a an a, a, a counter argument so that so that we can make an informed decision based upon other lenses that we haven't heard from yet in this conversation. I, that, that I, I will do that if that's what we need now. Uh, Fred, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of things to say about it, but Fred brings up comparisons with other towns and communities, which I just don't think are relevant because I think every town is unique. The, the setup, the the structure of our commercial industrial sector is totally different from Greenfield, which has a large downtown area, Amherst, which has two or three colleges, depending on how you look at it these days, and a downtown area, and Great Barrington, which is a tourist summer area and has a downtown commercial. We essentially do not have a downtown commercial area. We have two in particular large multinational corporations. No. Properties. And while they have been wonderful neighbors and the like, their industrial properties represent 50% of our industrial assessments. And between, depending on which year you take, between a quarter and a third of the combined CIP. This is totally unlike any other town in our area, except perhaps Irving, which does have a split tax rate, which has one large industry in particular and no significant downtown area. Uh, I think that this difference in the structures of the commercial sector in these towns is very relevant to this discussion. Uh, I also think that the use of comparison spread of tax rates is no more relevant. When companies look to see where they're going to establish business, they don't come and say, what's your tax rate? They want to know how much money they're going to be paying, period. It, it, when you go into a supermarket, you don't start by looking at the price per pound of items. You start by looking at what do you want to buy? So you're not comparing the price per pound for rice, rice and saffron. Uh, because it's not a relevant comparison. Uh, tax rates get arrived at by different towns based on how much they spend, by how much their residential bases are, what their, how their assessments are based. Tax rates are simply not compar comparable across towns. It's a meaningless, as far as I'm concerned, comparison. If our rate is 1359 per thousand and another town's is 1753 per thousand, that tells you nothing about how much tax you're going to pay. It tells you nothing about how much revenue you can expect to make from your location in that town. It's in, in a vacuum, it's a meaningless number. When taken with the tax levy and assessments, it becomes meaningful, but only in conjunction with those, with those other two to create how much money are you going to be paying? Uh, and I, I think having looked at this now, I, I came in with a very open mind about, I, I want to push the process, as Paul said, to see, to study it. But I came in not on either side. I believe that a split tax rate would serve the town well because we have a large senior 
fixed income population that would benefit greatly from a reduction in their property taxes of whether it's 150, 200, $250 a year on the average property. Our large companies would be absorbing most of that. I, nobody wants to pay more taxes. And I would love to find a way to take as much burden off of these small businesses as possible. But at some point there's going to be, you can't pick and choose, you pay more individual company, you pay less individual land uh, residential owner. Our largest assessed values, our largest taxpayers are international corporations that are benefiting from a very regressive tax. And I think that splitting our tax rate here is a way to make the property tax more progressive. I do not think it significantly is a significant number for small businesses, for businesses which are on properties with smaller assessments. Uh, you know, I, I looked up muffins, for instance. Muffins would pay roughly $1,500 a year more at a 20% split. Is that good for muffins? No, they'd rather not pay $1,500 a year more, obviously. On the other hand, for muffins business, we're talking about $5 a day, a cup of coffee plus a day. It is, I would rather not have them pay that if they if we didn't have to, but if that's what it takes to get the extra 10 or 15 or whatever, $20,000 out of our larger properties in order to give our fixed income people, particularly seniors, a significant break, which in some cases they can go back and spend at muffins. I think that that's a trade-off that I'd be willing to make. Hey, Fred, can I, I just want to give you a, a, a comparison. You, you talked about the, the cup of coffee example yep. for muffins on a daily basis for that 1500 divided by 365, obviously. By, by 300, actually, they close Sunday. Okay, okay. So um, using that same formula, uh, if you're gonna save a resident $150, and it could be 200, it could be, I'm using 150. Um, that is 41 cents a day. A absolutely true, but that 41 cents a day or 150 for the year means a lot more to a family living on a social security check than the 1500 likely does for muffins or that the 15,000 or whatever it is means to Yankee Candle. That, I, I've, I've, I've talked to some people in town. They, people on fixed income would like to, you know, are scrimping and saving. And if you can save them 150, $200 a year, that's real money. Even if it's only 41 cents a day, it's real money for people who are giving up things because they've got no alternative source of income. What about, well, the, then the other, that argument, we should be means testing the residential because there are several people on fixed incomes in this town who live on a lot more than, a, than an annual social security allotment. No. That's, that's a completely different dis discussion if you, want to, if you want to have. But for now, that's not the discussion we're having. Yeah, Lynn, go ahead. Um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, in this economy right now, everyone, all the businesses are struggling to keep, stay alive 
with the whole COVID situation and the cost of everything going up along with the rest of us, everything going up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd hate to see some of our smaller businesses affected that way. And secondly, um, there are exemptions that the elderly can already apply for that are the low income elderly um, Perhaps rather than doing a split tax rate, we may want to get the information out that those exemptions are available to the seniors on the low income, anyone over 70 years old. So um, I I just, uh, I I worry about our small businesses. That's all I'd like to say Um, for, you know, $1,500 to me is a lot of money, even for a, a a company the size of Muffins, Um, especially given that all of their costs are rising and, um, you know, they can't price themselves out or they won't have any business. Uh, They've suffered over the last two years with COVID and hitting them now again with additional taxes just seems to me not the best. I, I, I agree. I would love to figure out a system where we didn't where there was no impact but there are going to be there, there's going to be impact that is less than desirable and it's a question of balancing the interests of what is essentially a handful of small businesses and yes they will be hurt I do not disagree that they will that there are some that are struggling and could be hurt but against the de- depending on what numbers you want to use 700 to 800 residential taxpayers who will benefit who are in many cases also struggling through covid and recession so yes there there are several maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 20 small businesses that would suffer, but we've got hundreds of people on the other end who would benefit. Brother mm-hmm. Orlowski? Yeah, uh, I think we, we should look at, we need to look at the, at the, the big picture of, of what's happening in town and how, are, how is commercial development been going on and, and what are we looking at in, in, in the future? Uh, these big corporations that we talk about in town, uh, they help the town in many other ways. As you know, Jonathan, Yankee Candle gives the town money every year for police and fire protection. Uh, uh, Whaley, Deerfield, they also give Frontier scholarship money. That's been going on for almost 30 years from Yankee Candle. Uh, Covestro, the other big company in town, uh, their employees given 16 hours of free time to devote to community service. So they help the communities. That, them kind of donations mean more to a business like that because they get publicity from it. If you increase their taxes, it's just another bill they pay and it goes into the general fund. Nobody knows about it. So, you know, them, them businesses help the town in other ways other than paying more taxes. And if you look at Fred, do you have any reason to think that they would stop doing? Can I finish my discussion here? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you look at at major projects the town has had over the past five, six years, whether it's the town hall, the the uh, fire station, police station, uh, local businesses have participated. They've spoken up. They they've devoted their time to help the town and make improvements on these projects. I'm not saying that we save money by it, but they were there for the town. They helped, they participated in the town. And I think the other thing that uh, even a 250th celebration, local business helped with the cake and we're coming up with a 250th celebration this coming year where we want businesses, we want development to support us. We want their donations. We want them part of the celebration, not just to pay more taxes and go home. And the other thing I like to make is, is the point the board is, is promoting economic development. We've hired an economic development person to be on our staff. We applied for grants to look at economic development. 
in certain corridors in town. We even had an economic development study back in 2018 that identified some things that the town should be doing. I think we need to, if we're gonna focus on economic development, we need to promote that and, and get businesses to, to join in with us, not to tax them more money and look the other way. Can I just jump jump in for a second? Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, well, first, you know, Fred, Fred B, Fred's, um, Fred's got a great heart. And um, I, from his perspective, I can see where he's got many people in town in focus when he's uh, speaking about this. Um, what, what pulls me back is two things. One, Lynn said it, just, COVID-19 is not over. And to change things in the middle of COVID-19, from my perspective, would be an insult to um, the commercial people in town. But beyond that, and I don't, as I said before, I don't think we should let this die on the vine because there may come a time downstream when the situation in town is such that the finances, as we look to the future, uh, may not be um, may not be to our liking. And we may have to do this. So I go back to Fred B. And I would say, Fred, look, we can't have anecdotal reasons for doing this. There has to be some kind of a, some kind of stick in the sand that says this is going to happen and we need to do this because of that. And, and, and it has to be more. I mean, if you want to, as someone said, if you want to take a poll of the entire town and see where they are in regards to their ability to pay taxes, I, I guess that's something that could be done, but it just has to be more than an anecdotal feeling. Um, and um, I'll end with that. Okay. Fred, Fred, Fred B, you were going to say? No, I'm, that, I'm fine. Okay. The, the last thing that I would, I just want to add that I also don't think we should be making a decision based upon the static economic climate uh, in town. We want more small business to come to Waitley. We don't want less small business to come to Waitley. We, we have tremendous pressures on our budget and um, we, we need entities like a muffins, like other places to come into Waitley and pay a significant amount of tax dollars to help us run our town as, as well as we have historically run it. And I worry about the message that we are sending with a split tax rate that when small business or businesses are trying to decide where they want to plant their seeds, they're going to look at the tax rates and they're going to say, or the, the, the structure of the tax rate not the percentages, because I agree with you, Fred, about, about the percentages. They, they mean nothing. But the structure of the tax rate, they're going to say, you know what? I want to go to a, 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 a town that has a little bit more of a, of, a, of a friendly climate for me and who is demonstrating that they want me to be their, their neighbor. And I, and I worry it, that, that, that the split tax rate doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, if, if I can just answer that very quickly. Hadley has just gone to a split tax rate. And I don't think there's any, you can say there's any town around here that is more commercial friendly than Hadley. Yeah. And, and, they, depend, and they essentially on... sold, sold their soul to Route Nine, for Route 9 development. That's right. And they have just increased, just split their tax rate. That's true. So I don't know that splitting the tax rate labels you anti-business or anti-development. It is in my mind, just a way to get, essentially get more money from out of town sources rather than in town sources. And since so much of our tax base, industrial, the industrial okay. commercial base is from such a large percentage is from the large industrial entities, which are from out of town that makes us different from these other from other towns and i think that 
where a company, a small business chooses to place its flag will depend on, how, on whether they think they can make money there. Not, I think that a couple of thousand dollars for a business that's gonna be doing a half a million to a million dollars a year or 250,000 or whatever the number is. Let me just take as an example, the cannabis industry. Whether it, a cannabis retailer opens here is not going to depend on whether it's paying an extra two or $4,000 when according to an article in the Northampton Gazette a few weeks ago, their initial investment's a million and a half to $2 million to open their door. That's just, I, I don't think that there's a message. I think that if they wanna be, if they think their location is good here, this is where they'll be. And they're not gonna go, oh no, they're anti-business because they've got a split tax rate. They're gonna go where they think they can make money. Okay. I, I appreciate. I really do appreciate that perspective. Um, but you got to remember, there are there are there are businesses that are Waitley I owned and operated. And absolutely, resident. no. I I acknowledge that, and I. But I also see there are people, there are businesses that will suffer, and there are people who will benefit, and that that's the balance we have, that has to be made. We're going to wrap this up soon, Fred Orlowski. Yeah, uh, I would just say. The the uh, CIP percentage for for Waitley is twenty percent. That's what they paid. That's the that's the twenty percent of all property uh, assessed values of property in Waitley. Twenty percent of all values are for the CIP communities. It's not fifty percent or whatever. It's twenty percent, which is typical of all communities, a majority of communities in Franklin County and even. Uh, Western Massachusetts. Fred, one, once other, again. The other thing on, on uh, Hadley's tax rate, that the reason they went to a split rate is because their, their CIP properties, assessed values went down this past year, and which meant that their property taxes would go down for the CIP properties. So they had to do something to make up the difference. And that's why they have a, they have a split rate. That that didn't that wasn't a complete story in the paper that came out. It was on the Hadley News website that yep. you could see okay. all that. Where there was a difference in in uh, in property values in Whaley, our commercial and our residential values are increasing every year. We keep going up by a, by an average of two or three percent. This past year was more because we had a revaluation re year, but we're consistently going up two or three percent. It's not like commercial is going down. No. Okay. 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 Fred then, Barron, you're I, getting word. Can I get it once, John? Can I get yeah, one no, more? I, I said, Fred Barron, you're getting the last word. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay. Two things. One, yes, our commercial industrial percentage is 20%. It's not that percentage that I'm talking about. It's the percentage of the large businesses that comprise that 20%. That are that twenty percent yes is comparable to other towns, but I would bet that our twenty, our large industry, comprising a quarter to a third of that figure is very different from the other towns. As far as the deep, you know, the value of the commercial properties, based on this year's revaluation, <laughs> the. Our two biggest properties both were went up in assessment by seven to eight percent. The average assessment in town went up by twelve and a half percent. If the tax levy to were, were to remain equal this year, the tax bill for our two biggest properties would go down. They would pay less in taxes next year than they would this year because their assessments went up by less than the average. I'm okay. done. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we need to make a motion. Um, you want to make a motion to close the public hearing? I think if you okay. guys are, okay. if you guys, if everybody in the public has had a chance to, to are, say are the there piece. any other, I, I promised Fred Barron the last word and, and uh, <laughs> from us though, <laughs> uh, because we can't, we can't kick this around for, 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 for the rest of the night.
Does Just anybody have one quick thing to say? Let me just say if, if you want to Fred, well, hold on, Fred. We got yeah. other people. Okay, uh, go ahead. I, I don't know which one. Catherine, do you have the comment or or no, go ahead. Mark does. Okay, go ahead, Mark. I, I've been listening to this and I don't want to belabor it, but I want to make one point. Uh, I don't know exactly how the town would fare if somebody like Yankee Candle walked away. I just want to make sure that the town doesn't look short sighted. You see a lot of towns in New England where they had one big tax tax based commercial property that supported so much of the town's revenue, and they walked away because the town became a little bit overzealous with the taxing. So I just want to make sure that the, whatever conversations had, they looked to the, the long term picture of tax stability for a business because not the rate, but the stability is probably the most important part. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Oh. All I would say is if you want a recommendation from the Board of Assessors, we met and we can give you that recommendation if you want. Um, well, I'm not sure we, we would need it in writing uh, and your minutes, Fred, but if you want to pr provide that later on, that's great. It would have been probably helpful to have that um, that that in writing prior to this, but that, that'll be great for, for the record. Okay. And if I can, you, you said I could have the last word. I just want to make one response. <laughs> I, I will take that that opportunity uh, to the point just made about the companies leaving town. Yes, the big companies absolutely could leave town. Uh, given the size of their investment in town, the reason they would leave town would not be a $20,000 or whatever it is increase in their taxes. It would be because their labor costs in other someplace else, whether it's Tennessee or Cambodia, would be so much less as to make the millions of dollars in of cost and moving worthwhile. Just the, the scale of taxes versus labor costs is just, they could leave, but I, do, I would just submit the taxes in Waitley would not be the reason. Yeah. Anecdotal. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's always going to be an anecdote of a company that left someplace when taxes went up. But there's also going to be, you don't hear it in the news that companies leave a place even though the taxes didn't change or they went down. That, I mean, it's, I, I, I tend to agree with Fred. I don't think that's the, I mean, we had, uh, we've had we had companies come to the select board in the past and and swear up and down that, that you know, oh, this this tax, it's going to, it's, you know, we, we need, you know, we need you to, you know, do something about this and uh, the, you know they had changed their status and therefore where they had to owe some property tax and how well they could they could move everything to Agawam and they didn't you know they'll, they'll get up and say whatever and they, they didn't actually move <laughs> they 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 changed their tax status knowing full well that what they were going to have to pay on this end they saved in some other place so the picture like how companies make decisions we don't control most of the things that have drive them to make a decision uh, for, for the big companies. For the small companies, that might be a little different. And that's where, I, that's where my worries are more. Uh, that's why I wanted to know how much, I mean, the thing's frustrating to me is the state has really, has our, our, our hands are tied as far as what we can discount. Like we can't say, well, we think it's more appropriate for a small business to be up to 20 employees. Can't do that. State law. State law ties our hands on what we can do with local taxation. And uh, and so to me, that's where I'm still struggling. So, um, sorry. I wasn't supposed to say the last word. That's great. That's great. I, I um because it was it was it was very um uh on the fence choice. So that was a great last word. Um, okay. <laughs> So I just want to close this by, by saying that regardless of how the vote turns out, I like this, and, and Fred deserves a lot of credit for this, Fred Barron. This is the first time that we've had this extensive a conversation about this yeah. topic, and yeah. we should do, be doing everything we can to promote dialogue because in our society today, um, we shy away from this type of dialogue because sometimes it might be uncomfortable. And I, and I think that's, that's great. And, and it's one of the reasons that I've been proud to be on this board for so long because we, we do embrace dialogue as opposed to, to shunning it because it may be uncomfortable. Um, that being said, we do have to make a vote uh, and there are three of us. So 
there will be probably two winners and, and one loser. Uh, but I don't want, I shouldn't phrase it that way. Um, and you want, you want to close the public hearing first. You want to close the public hearing. I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry. You got um, it. I, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. I'll second that. All those in favor, Fred Barron? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. The, mo the hearing's closed. Now, Brian Domina, can I now make a motion? Yes, and you'll want to do it. I'll bring up the, you're going to want to address the, the three questions, right? The split tax rate is, is one of them. Okay. I'll bring it up um, here. And, and again, you guys, I don't want to hog the, hog the, 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 the light here. Um, oh, yeah. So Joyce, do you want to make a, you want to make the, the, a, a motion and then Again, I'm I'm looking for a a, a, a okay. positive, you know, a, a motion where we anyway, Joyce, why don't you start? Um, okay. Um I'll make the motion that for the coming year we continue with a single tax rate. I really want to keep studying this though. I want to keep learning more. I would second that. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. No. Me, yes. Uh, single stat rate, single tax rate is maintained by a two to one vote. Um, Fred Barron, you wanna make an, uh, what I think is probably an easy motion on the open space discount? Uh, I move that we do not adopt a an open space discount. Uh, I'll second that. All those in favor, Fred. Aye. Joyce. Aye. Me, yes. Um, I, I will move that we do not adopt a residential discount. Second. All those in favor, Fred. Aye. Joyce. Aye. Me, yes. Um, I will make a motion that we do not adopt a small commercial exemption. I'll second that. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Oh, that surprised me. Okay, three to nothing. Unanimous, great. No, no point in that discount without the split rate. That's right. I, it means it's meaningless without a split rate. And if there's only two companies that benefit from it, or possibly three, it it's also not very meaningful. If we're gonna, yeah. You know. Okay. Um, that's it. Uh, we have our 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 uh, tax structure for the coming year. Our tax rate structure for the coming year. And let but me I say, I do it, want us to keep studying it though. I want to learn more about this. If yeah. I can say thank you to Fred and Paul for participating so actively in the Ansberger. in the group that studied this, I think we had meaningful discussions both there and here tonight. Perfect, I love it. Thank you, Fred. Now I hope everyone Please. sticks around for the for the for the next agenda items. Though I fear that that's a uh, pipe dream on my part. <laughs> so uh, let's go to host community uh, agreements, Brian. Sure. Um, we had met with, I see John Dewey here and um, Rebecca, I think. That's your last name, John, so I assume she's with you. Um, yes, she is. Um, and you, you recall our discussion, um, actually, it might, have, might have been two meetings ago, two meetings ago, um, about um, they, want, want, they wanted to come in and sign the host community agreement with the town and while they were searching for prospective tenants. Um, and I believe they had their community outreach meeting today, right, John? And how did that go? That's right. Uh, Charles Smith is on the phone with us. He hosted the meeting. Uh, Mark and Catherine were there and DeWitt and uh, our one of our other abutters, uh, Bernie Smorowski. And it was uh, similar to our prior community outreach meeting. Uh, we fielded the usual questions. Uh, our plans have not changed in any respect in terms of the building footprint or the site plan approval. 
Um, but as we lost our tenant a month ago, we're in the process of uh, searching for a new one. But as we discussed last month, that it's in all of our interests, the towns as well, to allow us to go forward on the licensing process in parallel with our search for a tenant. And then as we uh, revised the agreement, we put in front of Joyce, uh, there's always a provision that once we identify a tenant, the tenant will have to circle back and be approved by the select board. Okay. So Brian, what do we do? What, are, what, are we, what actions are we, are we required to um, take? So Joyce and I have reviewed the agreement um, and really the, the, the one significant change in it um, is just the, there's, a, there's a paragraph about um, assignment mm -hmm. And that's at the bottom here. It's it's all the same terms that um, were provided to um, NAP advisors, which was the the the, the previous uh, tenant that did not work out. Um, so, I mean, I think Joyce, our rep, I think Joyce might have a recommendation. Right. Yeah. I I, I basically would we it, we came down to I think two things we wanted added in there besides sort of the name change. One was this um, uh, that their assignment of the HCA would require written approval and consent of the town acting through the select board. And that's what that last item in 12 is. I think up a little earlier, the new, um, the tenants um, would also need to do a community outreach meeting. I think that that's a little, I can't remember what page it's on. I thought it was on an earlier page. Uh, oh yeah, oh no, it's right there. It's right there yep. and that's, oh, it's all in one, that one place, okay. Because I remember those being the two the two main things we wanted uh, to be sure got added, and none of the other terms got changed. So that's where we stand with this. Um, I'm ready to support it. Um, everything else, as you, as you can see, it's something, um, uh, and they just added on the on the whereas is there's there's an additional whereas. Um, there was. Uh, um, uh, since this is one where they have to uh, apply this to a, another cultivator. I believe the, the address mistake that I noticed got corrected too as well, yeah. I think. Um, but I, but I, I'm ready to, to move that we, um, let's see, is this accept as a new HCA or just amend the existing one? I would do it as, an, as a new approval. Okay, then I would move we approve this host community agreement, replacing the previous host community agreement uh, with this new one. Second. I was going to say before I hear a second, are there any questions that, that anyone wants to have addressed? But since Fred seconded it, no, uh, it we'll move to it. You, you no, can probably right. still have discussion even with a motion open That's on right. the floor. I, I, I was, I was bringing a little Martin, Catherine. Oh. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, we, I, I had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is this host community agreement something that we can access through the Waitley website? Is that available to anybody or um, for us to review, for example? No, but I can, I can, it's a public record. If you request it, we can send it to you. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, we had the pleasure of actually talking to uh, Mr. Smith, Attorney Smith, and um, several other people, the engineer, and they were very forthright in the information that they shared with us. There are still some concerns we have, and I, I don't know if because this agreement has already been made, et cetera, that it's just a done deal, um, or if these concerns can be addressed with Mustang or with, you know, through the HCA or whatever. Um, so that's, that's another question that uh, mm. has come to mind. What's the concern? Um, well, we did discuss a little bit about odor mitigation and I know security. We, and security, um, water usage, obviously, and uh, traffic, et cetera. Mm. But the, the largest concern that we have being a butters and very close to butters is odor mitigation. And the engineer was um, helpful in describing the plan that they have to mitigate the odor. And we understand that according to the Waitley bylaws, there should be no odor at all. So um, I mm -hmm. guess 
the, really? I have a curiosity as to whether or not we have any recourse if in fact there is odor. Really? So so what I, what do we I, do yeah. that happens? Yeah, Brian can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that's not addressed in the HCA. Okay. Uh, but it is addressed by their, they need to have, the, have a special permit. They need to be seeing, I think, the planning board and the ZBA. And that's the place where they can talk about, um, you know, what, what are the conditions they have on their special permit? And if they're breaking those conditions, then the building inspector gets involved and that's how that gets enforced. Okay. So it's really the enforcement mechanism for those things lies with other boards, not with the select board. Um, but I, I think you're 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 right to um, to press on that. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where things stand with the special permit uh, at this point, but that would have definitely come up at the at the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, um, wherever that stands at this point. Okay. Yeah, they they currently have a. You know, they, they have their previously granted special permit and insight plan approval from the planning board. Um, so um, it would actually be in, in the form of a of a complaint for a violation of the zoning bylaw if, you know, if there were to be circumstances that I guess that were objectionable and that were went against the, the conditions of the permit or the zoning bylaw. But um, yeah, so, yeah, the HCA Catherine. is not really the play the place right now. Yeah. Yeah, Mark and Catherine, I'd be happy to send you copies of all the prior approvals and more details on the odor mitigation measures that we have, because that was approved back in, uh, was that Brian, 2019? Mm -hmm. So we're still relying upon those approvals and the same engineering design. So it, maybe I get you guys caught up and just give me a phone call and we can talk through the specifics. That'd okay. be great. That would uh, be wonderful. The, the question I had was, uh, my understanding is that this uh, new Waitley Cultivation LLC, if you will, will be getting the permit for the HCA. Is that actually, uh, uh, and will the transfer that permit to the grower or will the grower re reapply for a new permit? Special permit rests with the property owner. That's Mustang Waitley. Waitley Cultivation Partners will be executing the HCA and applying for a license with the state CCC. Once we identify a new tenant, we'll sign a lease with them, we'll assign the host community agreement to the new tenant, subject to them coming back, doing one more community outreach, and then getting an approval from the select board. So it's a multi-step process, but that time we have to spend with the CCC licensing can be um, can be lengthy. Uh, previously, it was about a 12-month process plus architecture review board. Since they've done it once before, we're hopeful to get through it in a much shorter time frame, perhaps four to six months. We're, we're motivated. We have about three or four very strong prospective tenants, cultivators, we'd like to bring into uh, the community so we can get moving on the economic program. Um, but we have to dot I's and cross T's, including the state license to get the first base. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There is a motion and a second on the table. Um, I believe that Joyce made the motion, so I will uh, nod my head to her first and say, Joyce. Uh, Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Um, <clears throat> Thank you all. No, thank you. Um, you, you. You've been very cooperative and, and I appreciate that and we all do. Um, 22 license renewals, calendar year 22 license renewals, I should clarify. Brian, what do we got? We have, I'll bring them up on the screen here. And this is gonna go fast, right? You could vote all, you could vote all of them at once if you'd like, uh, but let me just bring them up. Well, efficiency is my middle name. License renewals. So these are calendar year 2022 20, license renewals. Um, and here's what we have. I'll just run through them, okay? Real quick, general on-premise alcohol, all alcohol, uh, weight and investments, that's castaways, entertainment license, weight and investments, castaways, in holder, all alcohol beverages, the Waitley Inn, in holder license, the Waitley Inn, common victuals licenses, Waitley Inn, Norea, that's the Waitley Diner, muffins, Tom's Long Dog and Grill, Circle K, 
uh, retail on-premise wine and malt, uh, Nuria, which is Whitley Diner, um, and Circle K. Retail packaged goods. So these these last two were like were alcohol licenses. Uh, muffins, automatic amusement device. I'm not sure why we still have these licenses, but we do. Um, Nuria, and there's four for uh, the Whitley Diner. Um, class one, uh, Whitley vehicle sales in Orchard Trailers, and Class two Zanoni's Garage. I would want, I think, that license conditioned on the submission of the paperwork because that's the one that we don't have yet. Well, as Amy Go Valley tells me, we got one today. Okay. Um, my, my question is: Did did um, did the owners of the castaways submit an application for 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 their two licenses? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, they're 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 they want to renew their licenses and they paid the fee. Really? Okay. I, I just I thought anyway. No. Okay. And Amy, have we heard from Zanoni's at all? No, but I I left at eleven. I don't have any messages on my phone. All right. So that let's do that as a different motion then to make that condition on the receipt of paperwork. If not, then it'll it will expire. Is there a deadline for that? I mean, if it expires, does it expire effective date not tomorrow? Our licenses are on a yearly basis, so it would be December thirty first. December thirty first. Okay. So if he if he submits on the thirty first, he's good. Assuming it, assuming it's if, a if business we, day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get my point, though. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay. If you make the motion condition on the receipt of, of paperwork, yeah. Okay. Before December thirty first. I've I've got one question. Uh, were castaways licenses conditioned in any way when they were renewed with the new owner? And if so, have those conditions been met? Yeah, yeah with the, I don't think the board would not, the board would not have allowed them to uh, mm -hmm. open if those conditions were not met. I mean, there are ongoing conditions on, on several of these licenses. Yeah. And, and those and, carry forward each year. And Fred, to answer you, the second part of your question, um, a lot has been sort of moot because it's been closed. The conditions right. were based upon, you know, they're 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 doing certain taking certain security measures. Um, you know, they did build their wall and they've done certain steps, but other steps are 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 moot at this point because they just haven't been open. Yeah, there was. I'm just. Was there any um, condition as far as maintenance of the property in general? Because the place is a mess. Mm. It, yeah. It's not typically something that we've required of other licensees. Okay, so it's just the, the, the their weeds thing, yeah. growing. It's just, yeah. but I mean that that's true of a lot of lot. Sadly, that's true of a lot of properties in White Lake. Well, yes, but they, but that one property has had a lot of conditions attached. I didn't know if right. the general appearance was one of them. Yeah, no, it 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 it, it was it wasn't. Though I would love to put those conditions on a series of properties, including properties owned by the town of of Whateley. Um, <laughs> but um, um, so I would entertain a motion to okay. Well, all right, I'll give it a try. Um, I move that we uh, approve all the licenses that are on this list with the condition that they all have their paperwork in on time. I, my understanding is most of them do. But just let that be a condition for everybody. Second. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous. Brian, I believe you're hiding my screen, but I believe that is everything on the agenda. One one other quick thing okay. mm -hmm. that I added on there. This was the, the mass emotion grant, the regional mass emotion grant um, to expand. So this is from FERCOG is asking the the, the board to vote to sign on to a regional mass emotion grant to continue work on, on the age friendly, um, the age friendly efforts that are taking place. Um, I kicked it over to the board of health and Fran emailed uh, today um, with a recommendation that the board vote to sign on to that grant. Um, he thinks there'll at least be some complimentary efforts that the town would benefit from. Okay. Uh, well, I move that we sign on to the Franklin Regional Council of Governments Mass in Motion Grant. Second. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. 
Fred. Yes. Me, yes. Unanimous. Brian, when's our next meeting? The 22nd or the 15th? So we were originally uh, gunning for the, I uh, shouldn't use that term. We were originally hoping for the 15th, um, but we did not receive the butter cards from Verizon or Eversource today. Which we, we to go out the mail today. which we forecast was a possibility. Right. <laughs> the forecast was a possibility, but it we will not predicted be. that. Is it? <laughs> uh, utilities, as you know, are not known for moving quickly. Mm. Um, <laughs> oh, man, I should care what I say. Um, so it's going to have to be we need to mail them seven days in advance. So it can't be the 15th. Can it wait till after the first of the year or no? Um, I, judging by all the work they're trying to do around there, I think they would like it as soon as possible. Well, um, if, if that were the case, they should have sent in the uh, butter cards, right? I'm told that they that they did mail them, but but they're not here. So, well, <laughs> there, but we don't have them. Um, so, okay, so 22nd, we can yeah. aim for the 22nd if we want to do that. Let me just check here. Uh, Last yeah. time you said you could do the twenty second, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that has not changed. Okay, twenty second it is. Well, yeah, we'll we'll shoot for that then. Aim for that. Aim for that. You guys got to figure out how to send out uh, invitations, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, I know we know how to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That being said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Fred. Aye. Uh, Joyce. Aye. Me. Yes. This meeting is over. <laughs>